Hi, my name is Meg Roebling, and I lead research and insights for the client experience strategy team at Bank of New York Mellon. Here's a question for you. Have you ever had a stakeholder come and ask you to conduct a study about something, but you have a feeling that something very similar was probably done about eight months ago, but the person who did that study is no longer at the company and you have no idea where their research deck could be. If that sounds familiar to you, you might have thought that a research repository could help you solve those problems. A research repository promises to solve these problems by providing a platform to analyze and store qualitative research findings. This sounds amazing, and it's why they're so hot these days, as research practices scale and take hold. Well, this sounds amazing, and that's why research repositories are so hot these days, as, as research practices begin to take hold and really scale. Well, I'm here to tell you that they are amazing, but they're not going to do the work for you. And it does take a lot of effort to set them up. It requires that researchers change their way of working and invest the time upfront to become more efficient and have their work be more informed. It's that extra effort that results in a lot of people either not having a research repository or having one that they can't use. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about the five things that you need to do to get your research repository up and running. Before we dig into the how to build a research repository, let's take a look briefly at the why, what, and who of research repositories. All right, so why do we need research repositories? A research repository solves the problem of findings that are trapped in static decks or other non-searchable formats. Essentially, it's a database, a searchable database. Our research repository also provides a platform for doing your analysis, which is super helpful when you're collaborating remotely with people in different locations. In the end, it ends up speeding up the process. Even though there's a bit more work up front, it does really speed it up for the second half of the process. So research repositories also help you leverage past research more easily which makes redundant research less likely. You're gonna be able to find that research and share it more widely across the organization, which will also decrease uh, redundancy because other teams will be able to use the work that you've done more easily. All right, so just to level set, about what exactly is a research repository, because I think that it could mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But for us, we try to define it as a way to store our qualitative research findings in a database format. So essentially, we are taking our raw qualitative research inputs like meeting notes or interview recordings or WebEx recordings and uploading them to the repository platform. The platform then transcribes those recordings for us. We then do the work of going into the notes documents and transcript documents and tagging snippets there based on a tagging system that we create, which I'll talk more about. And then we group and sort those snippets based on the tagging system, sort of a, an affinity mapping exercise, if you will. And then from those groups, themes emerge. And from those themes, we create insights. And then those insights can be assembled together into a story. And then that story can be shared out easily from the repository as well. So as I mentioned before, it is a lot more work up front, especially when you are doing that tagging process, um, setting up the tagging system and actually doing the tagging. That part is more work than possibly your old way of doing things, but it does once you start to do the sorting and grouping and um, being able to look at that content in lots of different ways, uh, that part was, was really great and it really sped things up. So to be fair, this is a new way of working, right? Um, and that's a pretty important thing to remember here. So the old way that maybe you were doing it and one of the ways that we were doing at our company was that we had a, um, you know, a couple of people doing the research. We'd get together in a conference room and we'd, and we'd uh, take the, the important snippets and we'd put them on stickies, put them up on the wall, 
and then sort them physically, a physically affinity map them, group them together. We would see the themes emerge, we would write them down and put, put it into some sort of a report, like a PowerPoint. Well, in this new way of doing things, that whole process is now in a digital platform. Even if you were doing it maybe with Word documents or Confluence documents before, that process of, of tagging snippets uh, and grouping them uh, can now be done on this entire analysis platform. So it really is a new way of working. So who should be setting up a research repository? I would like to recommend that you don't try to take on this project if you are one of the only researchers in an organization, or maybe there's one of two researchers in the organization, because the the extra effort to set it up is probably not going to provide the the additional benefit that you need. But when you really do see the benefit, it's when you are working at scale, that when you have multiple researchers working on different dispersed teams throughout the organization, and the challenge is more about wrangling these different researchers and the data that they're creating so that you can share the benefits across working groups. So how are we gonna build this research repository? These are the five keys for adoption and I'm gonna tell you why you need them. You really do need to know your research culture. We're gonna dig into all of these individually, but knowing your research culture means how are you doing research at your organization? Assessing your data needs and providers. When you go about understanding how research is done in your organization, you're gonna take a look at what kind of data they're collecting and that is really going to have an impact on what providers you choose. Then once you've done um, this, this basic research, organizational research, you're going to have to get stakeholder buy-in. By stakeholder buy-in, I mean the approvers of the system. Okay, let's assume you got stakeholder buy-in, you've gone through the process of getting this tool and you have it up and you have user licenses. Now you need to create a tagging system that your entire organization can make use of. And then you need to think about where does this research repository sit within all of the insight systems that you might have within your organization. All right, number one, knowing your research culture. So you really cannot assume that everybody is doing research the same way that you might be doing it or that they will find a research repository useful. Perhaps in your head, you you absolutely understand the value of it and it's gonna be invaluable for how you do research, but you don't know if that's the case for everybody. And you don't even know if people would think that this is a great tool or not. So you really do have to reach out to other researchers within your organization and get them to buy in on this process. As I mentioned before, it requires a change in the way that you're working. And this is a lot more work in the beginning. And so it's really gonna require the commitment from people in your organization to do the work before they see the benefits. You can think of this part of the journey as a sort of a grassroots activism that needs to take place uh, throughout your organization. You really have to make clear what are the benefits of this research repository and make clear the commitment that is gonna be needed from everybody to make this thing successful. So if you remember anything from this presentation, remember this, you are going to need allies. Your aim here is gonna to be to assemble a core team of people who are invested in building a research repository and you need to get them to sign on to help you. You're gonna need them to help you with governance for starters. So I'm not sure if governance is a term that you may be familiar with, but simply a gov governance is a plan to manage this research repository, including data, um, usage, uh, rollout and maintenance of the repository. A steering committee can be this very core group of people. And this is a group that is gonna meet regularly to work on the topics that are gonna be required to get this repository up and running. Uh, the steering committee can help you with stakeholder buy-in. They can help you with creating a tagging system and defining new ways of working. So I don't think that any particular skills are really needed for this core team of people, your steering committee, but I would say that you want to look for people who are resourceful, who are um, creative, and most of all, they're motivated to solving the problem of scaling qualitative research in your organization.
So what I'm proposing here is that you embark on some organizational research. You need to understand who is going to be using this repository. Are they full-time researchers, people who are doing nothing but research? Or are they uh, people who do research, like a product manager, for example, or a UX designer? And to be clear, lines are often blurry with those two things. But think about who's going to be using this tool most. And then you need to think about the stakeholders who are going to be accessing this repository, uh, most likely on a read-only basis. These are the people who are going to be consuming the research reports that are generated. In the tool that we use, uh, we are able to share out um, individual stories or insights. So like on an individual level, we can sort of feed the fishes as it were. Sometimes you need to feed out little pieces of research um, as you're working on the synthesis to kind of uh, keep people interested and excited in the process. Uh, and then we also share out the, the final report. But one thing to think about is, are you going to allow those stakeholders then to dig into um, the source material that that came from? The tool that we work with does allow that, but we want to be able to, we made the decision to not allow stakeholders to have access to that raw data because we think it's important that it not be taken out of context and be considered really uh, as as a whole, right? Qualitative research is nuanced and you don't want somebody to take one quote as a representative of a whole client segment, for example. That is the domain of the researchers and that's your area, area of expertise. So make sure you, you set those clear boundaries. When you're thinking about your steering committee, you might want to think about possibly getting one person from each product team or line of business, right? So how are your research teams organized? Are they organized by product structure or line of business or some combination of the two things? But try to pluck one representative from each sort of main area who can then liaise with people on the people on their team who other people on their team who may be doing research. Also, you need to think about what kind of research are people doing? Are they doing foundational research? Are they doing generative research or evaluative research? What kind of data are they collecting during these processes? Are they just straight up interviews um, or are they usability studies or both? And then also, this is probably a really good time to ask what kind of data are they collecting? In general, what topics to do their interviews cover? Is there any topic that would be considered really um, highly confidential or highly classified? So start taking notes on that kind of information because you're going to need it later. Also, think about what screens are being captured during these usability studies. Are they screens that have account information in them or other PII? Again, take notes on this stuff because you're going to need to know that for the subsequent steps. Your goal for the organizational research should be to come out with a, a basic list of requirements that your research team would need out of a research repository and a roster of supporters that you can call on to help you. Now that you've understood who's doing what kind of research and what your general needs are, you can start looking at solutions. There's a growing landscape of research repository providers out there, so you need to come armed with your list of requirements. Don't plunge ahead with the first provider that looks good, but do assess an array of providers against your checklist. Your checklist might look something like this. You need a provider that ha can, a can provide single sign-on. They have to be GD GDPR compliant. They have to allow certain type of encryption that your company requires. More on that in a moment. Um, they have to have transcription. They need to have team level access control. These were all the things that we were looking for when we were shopping for a repository provider. Data classification. Most solutions that you're going to be looking at are going to be storing the data in the cloud which is why you really need to have a good understanding of the data that you are going to store. Now would be a really good time to have a conversation with your risk and privacy teams to understand their requirements around data storage and access. This step is extremely important for stakeholder buy-in, and you're gonna also need to include any requirements around the type of data that can be stored in your onboarding materials and governance materials. 
So for example, this is what we arrived at after conversations with our risk and privacy teams. We landed that we were not allowed to upload data that was considered highly classified, but we were allowed to upload data that was classified. And so for example, uh, each company is going to be different, but our company defines classified data as um, employee first and last name. Um, a client's first name only is allowed, but not their last. We are allowed to put the client's company name and their role. And we're also allowed to talk about projects that may be in development, right, that are not yet released. That's all considered classified data. But once you cross into the boundary of highly classified data, you're not allowed to store it in a third party managed cloud product, such as a research repository. And that kind of highly classified data might be PPI, personal private information, such as um, a client's last name or any other or an address or an email address. Anything that is personally identifiable information about the client cannot be stored there. Um, be careful with account numbers and uh, especially when you are doing usability studies that might have screens that are being shared. Be careful about that. Our legal team required that we sanitize any data before we upload it. So it's the responsibility of our team to make sure that that data is clean. We do include all this information in our training materials and we have users sign off that they will abide by these rules. If you wanted to add an extra layer, you could possibly include some sort of an attestation that the user agrees to every time that they log in. I know also that some per, some repository providers do have some sanitizing that they can do, but our legal team did not want to be totally reliant on that and wanted to make sure that all users of the system were compliant. Additionally, the fact that there was something like only 30 licenses or users across the enterprise made it more palatable to them, right? I mean, if we were handing out licenses to this tool to hundreds of people, I think that the risk and privacy teams might have taken a different stance on it. But because it was only 30 people, we were able to get approval for accessing and storing this kind of classified information. But really, it would be best if you didn't even include this information in your studies. So if you know that a client's last name is something that can't be stored, then don't even ask it in your interviews. Make sure you avoid that information if you can. Although I understand that sometimes it's hard to avoid it, so you'll just have to be careful to scrub any of that information from your materials before you upload it. All right, so now that you have your short list of providers and your data classification somewhat figured out, you can go ahead and run some proof of concepts. So I would suggest you get a couple of representative projects, smaller ones ideally, or just portions of larger ones, and run them through with trial access on a few of these providers. Again, make sure you scrub any confidential data, especially since this is just a trial. Okay, so let's assume you've decided who you want to go with. Your next hurdle is going to be to get stakeholder buy-in. And by stakeholders, I mean the people who need to approve of the repository and pay for it. You're going to need to show stakeholders the value of this tool and your plan for getting it up and running. Don't expect for stakeholders to sign off on this without a solid plan and detailed plan. So prepare carefully for this and you can expect up to six months or more for procurement. You may want to share an adoption roadmap with your stakeholders so that they can see the thought that you've put into this process once and that once purchased, it may take a while to take hold and become useful. After you've landed on a vendor and agreed on the pricing model, you can be begin procurement. Procurement is the process that a company goes through to make sure all of the checks are in place and the contract has the proper legal terms. So for us, Having that governance model and having had that conversation with privacy and risk smoothed the way for procurement. As you can imagine, at a place like a big bank, the security checks are quite rigorous. So it took about nine months for us to get through this process. And that was actually pretty quick 
for a place like a big bank. And uh, I know that it can take maybe six months, maybe three months, but I think you can expect um, somewhere between six months and nine months or sometimes even more. What I want to emphasize in this timeline is that the ex it's the expansion of the tool that may be the hard part. Because to be fully embraced, this tool requires a change in behaviors and in the way that research is done. You have to have a steering committee that meets regularly to assess usage and approve adoption. I've mentioned the government's model several times so far. And again, it's simply the rules of the road for using and maintaining this repository. You're definitely gonna to wanna to share some version of this with your stakeholders. This outline defines the various roles and responsibilities of the people involved in supporting and using the repository. On the left is the vendor engagement lead. In our case, it was me who led the charge in building this repository and getting it up. And I was the one who oversaw getting st stakeholder approval and the procurement process and wrangling the members of the steering committee. But once I had people who are committed, the steering committee were really, we are really the ones who are in building the rules and enforcing the rules, right? We meet regularly on this and we're responsible for making sure that any new participants, any new users of the repository have proper training and documentation. They understand the rules around privacy and risk. And uh, we continually curate the tagging system that we uh, all put, worked together to put in place. The rest of the team here are the people who are actually using the repository and are responsible for growing the repository. And they have to make sure that they stick to the rules. And we meet quarterly with all users of the system and we ask them to share uh, sample projects. The third leg of the stool are the people who are doing research, right? The regular people who are using this repository and are really helping us grow it. And we have to make sure that everybody here is sticking to the rules of engagement, following along with the risk and privacy rules that we set forth and are reaping the benefits of this repository, right? We want to make sure that they're happy so that they can proselytize for us, so that they can increase engagement with the tool. And we also want to make sure that the work that they're doing in the repository is being shared out to stakeholders, because that way we can increase engagement with the tool across the enterprise and increase investment in the research process and in this tool. Once you have your research repository up and running, you need to build a flexible tagging system or taxonomy to support the, uh, the analysis of the research. Creating a taxonomy might have been the harder part, one of the harder parts of the work in setting up a repository. So I will say the one thing to remember is that you really do not need to over engineer it. You want to really keep it simple, especially in the beginning and keep it flexible and continually curate it. Building taxonomies could be a whole class in and of itself, and it was admittedly pretty tough for us to get our heads around the right approach. I'm gonna to touch briefly on some best practices here, but if you want more information, I highly suggest that you check out Eloise Marzalesque on YouTube. She has a fantastic session that she did with Enjoy HQ that is really great and served as the foundation that we use to set up our taxonomy. If you can abide by these rules when you're designing your tagging system, you'll be in good shape. Keep it simple. Simplicity is gonna help you keep the taxonomy easy to understand for all who are producing and using it. Keep your audience in mind. The taxonomy is meant to serve the researchers and the stakeholders. Use relevant language. So use language that's for your intended audience and don't use, uh, so for example, don't use acronyms that um, your stakeholders might not understand or that is only specific to your team or your product. Leverage existing frameworks. Increase common understanding of the taxonomy by leveraging existing taxonomies that you may have at the organization. I'll talk more about that, but one hint would be to look at your your company's website to see how they have things categorized. Keep your taxonomy unified. Share similar taxonomies across lines of business or products. So for example, agree on component names. Keep your research questions in mind. Define and document your research purpose. We always try to do a research plan 
at the beginning of each study. And you can use those research questions as a way to group and sort your findings. And remember, business changes over time. You have to keep your taxonomy up to date and budget time for this work. Based on the platform that we chose, we had to come up with these categories of tags for our system. There was labels, tags, and properties. We had labels, tags, and properties. We used labels for tagging entire projects so that stakeholders could search for them. We used tags and properties on a more granular level. Those were for researchers who were doing the analysis. As you're defining your taxonomy, think about the organizational frameworks that might already be in place at your organization. When you're talking to researchers, try to gain an understanding of where they might fit into the product organization or what line of business they're, they're in, or ask them how they segment their clients. As I mentioned before, one good place to look is your company's website, as they will often have that organization already figured out. This screen shows our taxonomy that we put together. So on the left, we have the enterprise-wide labels and tags. And on the right are the product and study level tags. So for example, on the left, across the top, it's showing what kind of research is this? What kind of document is it? Is it a usability study? Is it a client interview? Then we got into the different clients that we have and the different lines of business and then the solution, and then the geographic region. So these tags can be used over and over again, no matter who's using it, no matter what researcher is using it, no matter what product they're using. Then we get into, on the right-hand side, we're talking more about, these are some possibly product-centric properties and values that you could use. What kind of navigation system is there? What kind of help area? What are the different component areas of this digital property, for example? And then looking also more specifically at the customer properties and values, right? Maybe the customers that are using this particular product are uh, uh, have more detail than the, the basic client level information that the enterprise tags will provide. And then you get into the more detailed study level type questions. What are the research questions that you're actually trying to answer? We ended up using the research questions as more sorting buckets and grouping buckets as a way to define the themes. Ultimately, it's up to you and it does take a little bit of trial and error, but we found it best to use the research questions in sorting buckets as opposed to a property or a tag, but it really depends on what your goals are. Finally, number five, create your insights system. Remember, a research repository is only part of an ecosystem of insights that you can be gathering. A research repository can hoover up all kinds of data, but you need to be intentional about how you intend to use it because without thinking through how you're going to how all that data is going to be analyzed, you run the risk of making it a data dumping ground. So take a look at other client insight systems that may be operating in your enterprise such as an, uh, an EFM platform, such as Merits or Qualtrics? Um, is there a user testing platform? Is there a user analytics platform? So think about the kinds of data that those are bringing in and think about how that will be different than the kind of research that you're using the research repository for. For us, the research repository holds only qualitative data, although the tool can really do much more. As I mentioned before, many research repository platforms allow you to plug in to client feedback tools like Intercom or into a CRM tool like Salesforce. We haven't, we haven't used any of those integrations, but we're looking holistically at the tools that are being used in the company to gather client insights, such as uh, survey tools and user testing tools or things that are measuring behavioral data. In an ideal world, all of these systems are connected and being considered as part of a insights ecosystem. Remember, to have your working group continually assess how the research repository is being used and tweak it. So finally, just to wrap up, remember that in order to be successful, a research repository requires that you get buy-in not only from stakeholders, but from the people who are going to be using this tool. They need to understand that there's a learning curve involved and it's going to require changes in the way that they're doing research. If you're willing to do the work, a research repository can be an incredibly powerful tool that will allow you to level up your research practice by more quickly and easily getting to better and more informed client insights. Thank you so much for your interest in this topic. 
I really look forward to hearing your questions and good luck setting up your research repository. Thank you.